Good evening and welcome to the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation and tonight's performance of Top to Toe, A Natural History of Clothing by a very talented and gifted musician and storyteller, Diane Taraz. Diane has performed here at the museum a number of times in the past and um, after you fall in love with tonight's show, you're going to want to take a look at the archive on our YouTube channel. So just search for Diane Taraz and you'll find uh, past shows and also a couple of clips that she's done here. I've really enjoyed Diane's performances. Um, any musician would, uh, musician, museum professional would appreciate uh, her research skills. She's not just a, a, a singer with a lovely voice or a skilled musician with stringed instruments, but she has a real appreciation for history and teases out details that um, I think someone with just a strict academic interest might otherwise miss. Um, sit back and relax and um, enjoy a natural history of clothing, top to toe. Diane. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, for many thousands of years, people crafted clothes and shoes from the fur and hides of animals. The 5,000-year-old Iceman, who was found frozen in the Italian Alps in 1991, had leather clothes. His waterproof shoes had bearskin soles, deer hide uppers, and laces of cow sinew. He didn't wear any wool because the sheep 5,000 years ago were more hairy than woolly. And over the centuries, people have bred sheep with thick fleece and each spring sheared it off and made excellent use of it. So I want to not wait too long before singing. I want to do an old English song in praise of sheep shearing and the time when the lads and the lasses uh, sheep shearing go. It's called A Rosebud in June. It's a rosebud in June, and the violet's in full bloom, and the small birds singing love songs on each spray. We'll pipe and we'll sing, love, we'll dance in a ring, love, when each lad takes his lass all on the green grass, and it's all to plow where the fat oxen graze low, and the lads and the lasses to sheep shearing go. And when we have sheared all our jolly, jolly sheep, what joy can be greater than to talk of their increase? We'll pipe and we'll sing, love, we'll dance in a ring, love, when each lad takes his lass all on the green grass. And it's all to plow where the fat oxen graze low, and the lads and the lasses to sheep shearing go. For their flesh it is good, it's the best of all food. And their wool it will clothe us and keep our backs from cold. We'll pipe and we'll sing, love, we'll dance in a ring, love, when each lad takes his lass all on the green grass. And it's fat oxen graze low, and the lads and the lasses to sheep shearing go. Well, wool contains lanolin, a wax that repels water but attracts dirt. As much as half the weight of a fleece is dirt and debris. The outer layer is longer and coarser and becomes worsted yarn. The soft inner layer becomes woolen yarn. You can clean worsteds with soap and water, but for finer woolens, you need lye or even better, urine. 
For centuries, households dealing with fleece would collect urine, which was pretty easy to come by, from horses or from people, and they'd let it age a bit and then use it to wash their wool, followed by, I'm sure, a great deal of rinsing. <laughs> the clean wool was dried in the sun and then broken with sticks to separate matted fibers. If it was colored at this point, it was dyed in the wool as opposed to dyed in the piece. And we still say dyed in the wool to mean something that was there from the beginning. The most common dye in centuries past was woad, W-O-A-D, a plant that makes a lovely blue color. Well, before you can turn wool into thread, you have to line up the fibers. And first, people used combs to do this. But in the Middle Ages, cards were invented paddles with metal hooks for scraping the wool. <clears throat> Cotton rivals wool as a prized material for clothing, and bowls and cloth found in New Mexico are 7,000 years old. And India has been weaving cotton for some 5,000 years. In about the year 800, Arab merchants first brought cotton to northern Europe. People there assumed it grew on trees, and in several European languages, cotton is translated to tree wool. In 1350, a popular travel guide wrote about a wonderful tree in India with tiny lambs on the ends of the branches, and the branches would bend down to let the lambs feed. <laughs> cotton was first spun by machine in England in 1730. And in 1793, Eli Whitney of Massachusetts secured a patent for his cotton gin, short for engine, and his gin cleaned and deseeded cotton 10 times faster than by hand and was a major factor in the growth of cotton plantations in the southern United States. Cotton must be carded like wool and then wound on a distaff, a forked stick that became a symbol of womanhood. Writers in the past called women the distaff side of humanity. To spin, you draw a few fibers from the clump on the distaff, twist them between your thumb and finger, and attach them to a drop spindle. And the weight of the spindle stretches the fibers, and spinning twists them together. Murals from ancient Egypt show drop spindles in use. Women generally spun at home. Weavers, usually men, traveled around with looms to weave the thread the women had spun. It takes 12 times as long to, we to spin thread as it does to weave it into cloth. And unmarried women with the most time to do it were called spinsters. Well, here's a song. <clears throat> I'm going to do it on this instrument called the dulcimer, the lap dulcimer or mountain dulcimer from Appalachia. And this is called The Serving Girl's Holiday, but <laughs> most of the song is taken up with all the tasks that she still has to do before she enjoys her holiday. I've waited longing for today swept the fireplace isn't cleaned and kept i haven't cut the rushes yet upon this high holiday and spin the bobbin and spool away what joy that it's a holiday in pale I need this high holiday and spin the bobbin and spool away. What joy that it's a holiday! The cooking pots I must fetch in and fix my kerchief under my chin. Darling Jack, lend me a pin to fix 
me well this holiday and spin the bobbin and spool away what joy that it's a holiday spin the bobbin and spool away what joy that it's a Well, genetic analysis suggests that the body louse, which lives in clothing, diverged from the head louse some 170,000 years ago, so people have been wearing clothes about that long. We have found sewing needles, in, uh, uh, sewing needles at least 50,000 years old, and some dyed flax from a Russian cave is 36,000 years old. And as early as 6,000 BC, the Egyptians had domesticated flax and were making linen cloth. The ancient Greeks and Romans wore unsewn lengths of linen or wool, belted with a sash. The Romans imported a bit of expensive silk, a mysterious fabric whose origins were unknown in Roman times. In the Middle Ages, nobles and churchmen glittered with gold threads and embroidery, setting them apart from the common folk. They also wore fur, until quite recently a sign that you had made it. My grandmother cherished her mink coat, which I unfortunately cannot wear for a great number of reasons. <laughs> the rich jealously protected their marks of superiority. At various times, in various places, it was a crime to wear lace or velvet unless you were of a certain class. Doing so meant you were stepping out of your God-ordained place. In Europe, the royal purple color could not be worn by anyone of less than the bluest blood. In medieval Spain, the richest families had skin so pale you could see their blue veins, distinguishing them from the darker colored moors. Throughout Europe, upper classes flaunted pale skin as proof they did not toil in the sun. Hats, veils, and gloves avoided the dreaded freckle. During the Renaissance, fashionable clothing was incredibly elaborate with lots of lace. Starch was invented to stiffen those neck ruffs which reached amazing proportions and must have been very uncomfortable. First there was needle lace and then bobbin lace crafted on a pillow. Such time and effort lavished on something essentially useless. Lace making provided work for many and countries created their own variants to cash in on this luxury item. Valenciennes from Belgium, Chantilly and Alençon from France, Venetian from Italy, Pointe d'Espagne from Spain, and cut work or drawn thread from England. Spinning wheels were invented in India in about the year 500 and reached Europe by the 1200s. You mount your distaff on a wheel that pulls and twists the fibers much faster than a drop spindle can. Small ones powered by a foot treadle evolved into those great big walking wheels, even more efficient. A woman might walk for miles from corner to corner of a room as she spun on one of those wheels. Dur <clears throat> Excuse me. During the American Revolution, homespun fabric was a form of rebellion. And in 1769, some ladies set up their spinning wheels on Lexington Green to protest British taxes on imported fabric. Those taxes prompted a two-year boycott of all British goods. And this song, published anonymously in the Boston Newsletter, hopes that women will lead the way in keeping the boycott. It says, uh, wear homespun and uh, reject proposals from any man not keeping the boycott. I don't know if this had an effect on the marriage rate. <laughs> and instead of tea, imported tea, they are to sip Labrador, which was brewed from an evergreen bush. <laughs> and I'm going to play this odd thing, which is similar to the uh, instrument that a woman would have played in colonial times. It's called an English guitar, and it's very lute-like. 
Young ladies in town And those that live around Wear none but your own country linen Of economy boast Let your pride be the most To show clothes of your own make and spinning If homespun they say Be not quite as gay as brocades Be not in a passion For once it is known, tis much worn in town, one and all will cry out, tis the fashion. And as one agree, you'll not married be to such as will wear London factory. At first sight refuse, pray tell them you'll choose to encourage our own manufactory. No more ribbons wear, nor in rich silks appear. Love your country much better than fine things. Begin without passion, twill soon be the fashion to grace your smooth locks with a twine string. Throw away your bohay and your green hyacinthe, and all things of a new fashion duty. Get in a good store of the choice Labrador. There will soon be enough here to suit ye. These do without fear, and to all you'll appear fair, charming, true, lovely, and clever. Though times remain darkish, young men will be sparkish and love you much stronger than ever. Well, the ladies in colonial times keeping the boycott were also supposed to do without silk, which England imported from China and sold in the colonies. Now, legend has it that in the year 2650 BC, Lei Tzu, the wife of the Yellow Emperor, was drinking tea under a mulberry tree when a cocoon plopped into her steaming cup. As she fished it out, a shiny thread unraveled, and sericulture was born. <clears throat> Silkworms munch on mulberry leaves for about 35 days, molt four times, and then spin a cocoon. A few are left to produce the next generation, but most are dissolved in boiling water and unwound into one continuous thread a mile long. Silk threads are triangular and reflect light like a prism. To make a pound of silk, you need 50 pounds of mulberry leaves and 3,000 silkworms. For a robe, about 5,000 caterpillars must die. Now, China carefully guarded its secret, and nobody else knew where silk came from or how it was made, and the penalty for exporting silkworms or their eggs was death. Starting in about the year 200, the Silk Road got its name from the mysterious fabric everybody wanted. Silk and other goods traveled this trading route some 4,000 miles. In the year 300, a Japanese expedition stole silkworm eggs and abducted four Chinese girls to teach them the art of sericulture. In 552, two monks visiting China hid eggs in their hollow walking canes and delivered them to the emperor Justinian in Constantinople. He made silk in his palace for royal robes and to sell at astronomical prices. Another story goes that in the year 600, the king of Khotan, west of China, tried unsuccessfully to get his hands on some silkworms. When he was betrothed to a Chinese princess, he warned her that if she didn't want to run out of fancy clothes, she'd better bring some cocoons with her, and the king got his wish. Synthetic fibers seem very modern, but rayon and nylon are actually rather old. Rayon was invented in 1855 when a Swiss chemist, chemist patented what he called artificial silk made from cellulose. You soak wood chips or rags in harsh chemicals, which makes a sludge, and you pass it through tiny holes like the spinnerets of a silkworm. 
and the filaments are woven into a shiny fabric. I believe this is rayon. Much cheaper than silk, sparing the lives of countless caterpillars. In 1889, a French chemist built the first factory to produce artificial silk. And in 1924, the Retail Dry Goods Association of America coined the name rayon from the French rayon for beam of light. And rayon became extremely popular in the 20s as women enjoyed dresses and lingerie as soft as silk, but much more affordable. Rayon is organic. But nylon is a true synthetic, a polymer made from petroleum. DuPont introduced it at the 1939 New York World's Fair as the first man-made fiber, and they originally wanted to call it No Run, but realized this was a bad idea, as stockings made from it would definitely run. <laughs> Soon they settled on nylon. And at the first public sale in 1939, 4,000 pairs were snapped up in just three hours. In 1940, DuPont sold 64 million pairs. During World War II, all nylon was diverted to military use. Some women drew lines on the back of their legs to imitate seams. And after the war, it took time to retool factories and women cut up tents and parachutes to make wedding dresses and such. Shortages in 1946 led to nylon riots. On one memorable day in Pittsburgh, 40,000 women lined up to buy 13,000 pairs of nylons with drastic results. <laughs> well, wherever your thread comes from, Turning it into cloth means interlacing the warp and the weft, threads that run in opposite directions. The mechanized loom, invented in the 12th century, lets you press a pedal to raise all the threads and pass a shuttle under them, then another pedal to reposition the threads and send the shuttle back the other way. In the early 1800s, English inventors created machines to turn raw cotton or wool into cloth they were weaving by steam. And I have a wonderful song from the time when uh, the mills were putting uh, the hand weavers who had used to travel around, putting them right out of work. They used to be the jolly bold weaver roaming from town to town, getting into trouble usually. But uh, now <clears throat> this man has fallen in love with a factory maid, a, a woman in the mills weaving by steam. And his father questions his choice, but he says, oh no, I'll follow her into the mill where we'll keep our shuttles in play. <clears throat> this is the hand weaver and the factory maid. Oh, when I was a tailor, I carried my bodkin and shears. When I was a weaver, I carried and my gear My temples also My small clothes and reed in my hand And wherever I go Here's the jolly bold weaver again Now I need a pick I'm a hand weaver to me trade I fell in love with a factory maid And if I could but her favor win I'd stand beside her and weave by steam Me father to me scornful said How could you fancy a factory maid When you could have girls both fine and gay Dressed like unto the Queen of May as for your fine girls, I don't care If I could but enjoy, my dear I'd stand in the factory all the day And she and I keep our shuttles in play The loom goes click and the loom goes clack The shuttle flies forward and then flies back the weaver's so bent, he's like to crack Such a wearisome trade is the weaving 
The yarn is made into cloth at last. The ends of the weft, they are made quite fast. The weaver's labors are now all past. Such a wearisome trade is the weaving. Where are the girls? I will tell you plain. The girls have all gone to weave by steam. And if you would find them, you must rise at dawn and trudge to the mill in the early morn. Well, in 1814, the first complete textile mill opened in the United States, powered by the Charles River, right here in this building. <laughs> English mills carefully guarded the industrial secrets behind their machines, but an inventor named Francis Cabot Lowell smuggled the technology in his head out of England and with fellow tinkerers created a factory full of gadgets. At this mill, bales of cotton came in the first floor to be cleaned and straightened by machines called pickers and carters. Speeders and ropers prepared a loose yarn for the spinning room on the second floor, which made warp and weft threads and dressed them with starch. On the third floor, clattering looms produced thousands of yards of fabric a day. Young women were the ideal workers with nimble fingers and few demands, but Lowell had to overcome the terrible reputation of mills in England where conditions were very bad. He attracted young women from New England farms by offering very high wages and a protected life in dormitories. And some factory maids sent most or all of their earnings home, and others saved up to get married or open a shop. The workday was 5 a.m. to 7 p.m., six days a week. Children as young as 10 worked as doffers, taking full bobbins out of the shuttles and putting in empty ones. And those little children earned more than most women made in jobs outside the mill. Heavy wooden shuttles with metal tips slammed back and forth and sometimes flew off hitting people, including one of my great aunts who was hit in the jaw and lost some teeth. Spinning belts caught clothing or hair with fatal results. At first the workers were treated well, but economic downturns and a huge influx of immigrants caused wages to fall and mill owners sped up the work, making it harder. But here's a song with a great deal of energy and a little complaining like most work songs have. It's called The Factory Girls Come All Ye. I love it when a song tells you where it's from. The first line says, come all ye Lewiston factory girls. We're in Lewiston, Maine. <clears throat> and a shaker is a hat. Come all ye Lewiston factory girls, I want you to understand. I'm gonna leave this factory and return to my native land. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way, sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. No more will I take my shaker and shawl and hurry to the mill. No more I'll work so pesky hard to earn a dollar bill. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way, sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. No more I'll take the towel and soap and go to the sink to wash. No more the overseer will say, you're making a terrible splosh. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way, sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. No more I'll take my bobbins out, no more I'll put them in. No more the overseer will say, you're weaving your cloth too thin. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way, sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. No more I'll eat cold pudding, no more I'll eat hard bread, no more I'll eat them half baked beans. I vow they're killing me dead. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. I'm going back to Boston town. I'll live on Tremont Street. And I want all you factory girls to come to my house and eat. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. Come all ye Lewiston factory girls. I want you to understand. I'm gonna leave this factory and return to my native land. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. Sing dum dee wickerty dum de way. 
Well, mills like this one <clears throat> depended on cotton from the South, which focused on growing that crop and almost nothing else. It was very profitable because the labor was free done by enslaved people. With their riches, southern states bought food, manufactured goods, and mill-woven cloth <clears throat> because they made nearly nothing in factories of their own. They shipped cotton to mills all over the world, and when the Civil War blockade stopped this flow, there was great hardship in many countries as well as in the North. Well, with all that cotton lying around, Confederate leaders thought, oh, our women folk can make homespun like the ladies did in the Revolution. But cotton must first be carded, and there were no manufacturers of cotton cards in the South. <laughs> Soon the price for cotton carters flew through the roof, and then they wore out, and that was the end of that bright idea. But even if Southern ladies had managed to make homespun, few would have worn it, because that was what the enslaved people wore, and clothing was an inescapable sign of status. Well, as mill work became harder, strikes and protests increased. In the Bread and Roses strike of 1912, workers in Lowell translated their meetings into 25 languages, reflecting the new Americans arriving daily. Shortly before the strike, Rose Snyderman, a New York activist, said in a speech, what the woman who labors wants is the right to live, not simply exist, the right to live as the rich woman has the right to life, and the sun and music and art the worker must have bread, but she must have roses, too. Well, once your cloth is woven, you treat it to create various fabrics. Gabardine is a worsted wool, and shark skin is also worsted wool, named after sharks because it's smooth like their scaleless skin. Brocade has patterns. Canvas was originally made from hemp, and its name comes from cannabis. Cotton can be batiste, lawn, or voile, so fine you can see through them. And cotton can also be muslin, calico, denim, or flannel, all so different. When cotton is sateen, it's pretending to be silk. The odd name seersucker <laughs> comes from Persian, which means milk and sugar, sheer or shakar, smooth and lumpy. And terry cloth is cotton with uncut loops. Its name is from the French tire, to pull out. I love the older types of fabric. Cambric is soft and glossy. In Scarborough Fair, a hopeful lover has to make a cambric shirt with no seams. <laughs> Crash, from the Russian krashenina, is absorbent linen made with rough yarns. Hopsack, a rough hemp or wool, was originally used for bagging hops. Tattersall, a plaid with fine lines, was named for a horse auction house in London where the horses wore checkered blankets. Padua soy was a corded silk popular in the 1700s, and lustring silk shimmers with two colors depending which way you move it. One of my greatest desires is to make a gown of lustring and be both pink and green at the same time. And I want to just put in a little word about stripes. In medieval times, they were highly suspect, as they did not show the clear hierarchy that the medieval mind loves to organize society. Outcasts such as condemned prisoners, street performers, lepers, and musicians, <clears throat> people on the fringes of society, were required to wear striped clothing, nearly always horizontal stripes. When the devil was depicted in the Middle Ages, he was always wearing stripes. Gradually, thin vertical lines became a mark of gentility in elegant wallpaper and pinstripe suits. And today, stripes are playful and bold, but we still associate horizontal black and white stripes with prisoners, even though very few prisoners have ever worn though, that clothing. We've just seen it in so many images, and right away we say, prison. Stripes still mean watch out, worn by referees and used to show places of danger like crosswalks. 
Well, after a boom during World War II, when the mills churned out uniforms and blankets, New England mills moved south, where unions were weaker. And then textile work moved entirely overseas. In the 1970s, Cy Khan wrote a beautiful but sad song about Aragon, Georgia, and the loss of a community. Aragon Mill. At the east end of town, at the foot of the hill, there's a chimney so tall that says Aragon Mill. But there's no smoke at all coming out of the stack For the mill has pulled out and it ain't coming back And the only tune I hear is the sound of the wind As it blows through the town Weave and spin, weave and spin I'm too old to change, and I'm too young to die, and there's no place to go for my old man and I. There's no children at all in the narrow, empty streets. Now the looms have all gone, it's so quiet I can't sleep. And the only tune I hear is the sound of the wind As it blows through the town Weave and spin, weave and spin The only tune I hear is the sound of the wind As it blows through the town Weave and spin, weave and spin Well, in centuries past, you could not go to a store and buy something in your size. The well-off had garments made just for them, and poorer folks wore looser clothes held on with belts and sashes. Servants might wear silk, but stained and tattered, given to them by their masters or bought at second-hand clothing fairs. And for centuries, the most stolen item was clothing. Everybody needed it, and the effort it took to create made it valuable. When servants or slaves ran away, they almost always took clothing with them. And here are some newspaper notices from the late 1700s, of which there are thousands. Three dollars reward. Run away the 6th of January, a Dutch servant named Patty Brannis, about 25, black eyes, curled hair, had on and took with her a black satin bonnet, a cloak with a hood, a calico short gown, two striped petticoats, and a white apron. Short gowns were working clothes, a loose jacket held on by an apron. Eight dollars reward. Run away on Sunday morning, a tall, stout Negro wench, about 28, and her child. The wench is named Lucy, is much pitted with the smallpox, and one of her lower teeth is out. The child, Venus, is five or six and has a scar on her shoulder. Took with her two short gowns, two petticoats, a striped gown, a yellow calico one, and a black petticoat. Eight dollars reward, run away on the 15th of May, an apprentice girl, about 14, named Eleanor McIndoe, of a fair complexion but small for her age. Had on and took with her two short gowns, two striped petticoats, new shoes with wooden heels, and half-worn yarn stockings. It is supposed she is gone with her mother and elder sister. And here is an ad for convict servants, sentenced to transportation in England and banished to the colonies. Australia was not yet in business for this. And someone here would buy the convict sentence and gain an unpaid servant for that amount of time. Run away, two English convict servants, John Eaton, a ship carpenter, about 23, had on and took with him a blue broadcloth coat and breeches, a Damascus waistcoat, a pair of ticken trousers, worsted stockings, three striped cotton shirts, one overshirt, a felt hat, and a pair of old shoes. That must have made quite a bundle for him to carry. Alice Eaton, alias Walker, goes for the said John Eaton's wife. 
run away to new Negroes, a fellow named Step, about five feet high, has his country marks on his temple and has lost some of his four teeth, appears to have a very honest countenance and is about 20, had on a white waistcoat and breeches, Osnaburg shirt and a tolerable good bound hat. Went with him a girl named Lucy, supposed to be about 12, wearing a white petticoat and striped waistcoat. Neither can speak good English as they have not been long in this country. They went off with several others, being persuaded they could find the way back to their own country. Poor Step and Lucy, surely not their real names, adrift in a strange land with a strange language, hoping to get back home. What became of them? We have no way of knowing. Newspapers were filled with ads for fleeing services, servants, apprentices, slaves, wives, and the occasional husband. The serving class was huge and unhappiness abounded. In a workshop years ago, I made an open front gown, the type of dress worn all through the 1700s. We sewed by hand, of course, and I learned that your own saliva will remove your own blood stains from fabric. We looked at gowns from 250 years ago. The stitches on the outside were even and attractive, but inside, where they wouldn't show, they were crooked and rushed because time was money. If only there were a machine to make all those stitches. The hunt began in 1790 when an English cabinet maker got the first patent for a complete machine for sewing. He didn't make a prototype and a later reproduction did not work. In 1804, machines patented in England and Scotland both failed. In 1810, a German invented a machine for sewing caps, but it never worked well. An Austrian tailor got a patent in 1814, but his machine didn't work either. In 1818, the first US sewing machine actually built failed to sew any useful amount of fabric before malfunctioning. It was like the early space program when all the rockets blew up. <laughs> the first sewing machine that actually worked was invented in 1830 by a French tailor, Barthélemy Timonier. It used one thread and a hook needle to make a chain stitch, common in embroidery. He opened a factory, but an enraged mob of tailors burned it down because they feared it would put them out of work. And poor Timonier did not try again. Well, in 1846, Elias Howe got an American patent for a machine with an eyed needle and a shuttle that slipped thread through a loop, making a lock stitch, much stronger than chain stitch. You had to crank it by hand. In the 1850s, Isaac Singer introduced a model with a foot treadle to pre free up both hands, but there was some resistance to the treadle as pumping your feet was considered unladylike and possibly immoral. Singer was a better marketer than Howe. He gave demonstrations in which a woman sewed a pair of pants in just 40 minutes. <laughs> he used Howe's patented lock stitch, so Howe sued him, and after 1854, Howe received royalties for every machine sold. His income jumped from $300 a year to over 200,000. <laughs> And by his death in 1867, he had made over $2 million for his lock stitch. During the Civil War, he equipped an entire Union regiment and served in it as a private. <laughs> well, as the first machine to invade the home, early sewing machines had beautiful painting on them to help them blend in with Victorian decor. Advertisements showed beautifully dressed women joyously creating clothes for themselves and their families, wearing the latest fashions. Helen Augusta Blanchard of Portland, Maine, patented the first machine that did a zigzag stitch, sealing the edges of a seam. And Helen patented 28 other inventions, including a hat sewing machine and surgical needles. Well, by 1910, electric sewing machines were chattering all over the world. For millions, it was a welcome miracle, but there was a dark side. The garment industry took advantage of cheap immigrant labor in sweatshops, where hundreds toiled in stifling rooms. 
They worked six days a week for 12 or 14 hours a day. The weekend would not exist until the 1940s. The most infamous sweatshop was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City, where hundreds sewed women's blouses in rooms who, as, whose exits were locked to prevent theft or unauthorized breaks. In 1911, the building caught fire, and the lint-filled air and oil-soaked wooden floors sealed the fate of 146 people mostly women and girls as young as 14. Outrage prompted improvements. But 16 years later, we have a lament sung by Fanny Bryce, who in her early career was not quite as much a comedian as she was a, a, a chanteuse. And from 1927, we hear the song of the sewing machine. And it's got a very uh, Yiddish feel to it. Um, and the lyrics are, are quite, uh, quite interesting. <clears throat> when I was young, on every tongue was a land that was milk and honey, where people were rolling in money far over the billowing sea. And so one day I sailed away with a heart that was light and sunny. I came to the land of the free. I ask you, is this liberty? There is no sun, there is no moon, there is no May, there is no June if you listen to the song of the sewing machine. The babbling brook the summertime is just a lazy poet's rhyme If you listen to the song of the sewing machine All through the day the drizzling rain is playing on my window pane And every drop is saying there is no lover's lane there is no song, there is no birds, and God is just another word. If you listen to the song of the sewing machine. And uh, that last verse is quite something. There is no song, there is no birds. I think rather than say there are no birds, the, they like the repetition. And it gives the idea this person's first language is not English. She just came from somewhere else. And then she said, God is just another word. That's, that's really pretty bleak <laughs> for 1927. Well, in 1947, Betty Hutton sang a lighter song, but it was also set in a sweatshop. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, in a movie about uh, silent film star Pearl White, who starred in the 1914 serials The Perils of Pauline. And in this song, Betty complains that long days working with the sewing machine leaves her no time or energy to get into any trouble or have any fun at all. Oh, the sewing machine, the sewing machine, a girl's best friend. If I didn't have my sewing machine, I'd have come to no good end. I bobbin' a bobbin' and pedal a pedal and wheel a wheel all day. And by night I feel so weary that I never get out to play. Oh, the sewing machine, the sewing machine, a friend in need. If I didn't have my sewing machine, a wicked life I'd lead. But I bobbin' a bobbin' and pedal a pedal and dream about romance. But by night I feel so weary that I never get out to dance. Oh, the sewing machine, the sewing machine, a helping hand. If I didn't have my sewing machine, I'd drink to beat the band. But bobbin' a bobbin' and pedal a pedal as busy as a bug. By night I feel so weary I can hardly lift a mug. Oh, the sewing machine, the sewing machine, me pride and joy. If I wasn't having me sewing machine, I'd have married James McCoy. But I bobbin' a bobbin' and pedal a pedal, and that's the end of Jim. Cause by night I get so weary, I don't even look good to him. <laughs> <clears throat> well, all kinds.
kinds of accessories used to be required when you went outside your home. In the 1800s, women wore a chemise, uh, a corset over that, a corset cover over that, a petticoat or two, a bodice, a skirt, a shawl, a cap, and a bonnet, and gloves were a necessity. As a child in the 60s, my annual Easter outfit included white cotton gloves, black patent leather shoes, a little purse to hold a hanky and my candy cigarettes, and of course, an Easter bonnet. Elaborate hairstyles once showed you were rich enough to employ someone to dress your hair a hair dresser. Wearing hats had a lot to do with hygiene. When people seldom washed their hair, a cap or bonnet quickly made them presentable. In the West, men and women in the 16 and 1700s wore wigs and sometimes shaved all their hair off to avoid lice, a common annoyance. Demand for beaver hats drove the exploration of North America, and fortunes were made in the fur trade. Everybody had to have a beaver hat to hold their head up in society. And men had long folded the brims of their hats for style. In the 1600s, musketeers turned one side up and added a big feather. In the 1700s, naval officers wore cocked hats, the sides folded and the points above the ears. By 1790, some wore them askew, and as the years went by, the hat rotated until by the War of 1812, the points were fore and aft. In colonial times, all three sides were folded, forming the tricorn hat. Look at photos from the Civil War, and you'll see that the soldiers are wearing caps with the tops bashed in to look dashing and dangerous. As soon as one style takes hold, another must be adopted to show you're on the cutting edge, as with backward baseball caps. Wearing stripes was a bold move until recently, and rugby shirts with their big horizontal stripes proclaim the player's roughness and rebellion. Women's hats have ranged from simple kerchiefs and hoods to incredibly elaborate creations that once supported an entire industry during the 1800s, horrendous numbers of birds were killed for feathers to adorn ladies' hats. That fashion passed, partly due to public outcry against the slaughter. But up until the 60s, men and women wore hats whenever they went out. President Kennedy practically single-handedly ended this tradition. Ladies in black churches still wear big, beautiful hats, but many people never wear a hat unless it's 20 below or they're in a baseball game. Footwear has a long history, full of discomfort. I have always wondered at wooden shoes. There's no chance of breaking in a shoe made of wood, so your feet must do the breaking. Before the 1800s, shoes did not come in lefts and rights. <laughs> British soldiers were advised to swap their boots every day so they wouldn't run crooked. I can't believe they would do that, but that was what the manual told them. Uniforms have always been a special kind of clothing. The British Army's red coat struck fear into the enemy, but only the officers could afford high quality dyes. So after long marches, the average soldier's coat was more pink than red. <laughs> <clears throat> the general poverty of your average soldier is the basis of, of this song, uh, Soldier, Will You Marry Me? <clears throat> and. Uh, in a reversal of the usual situation, a woman is asking a man to marry her. In the lower classes, things were less formal. <clears throat> soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your musket, fife, and gun? Oh, how can I marry such a pretty girl as you when I have no hat to put on? Off to the haberdasher she did go as fast as she could run. She bought him a hat, the best one there, and the soldier put it on. Soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your musket, fife, and drum? Oh, how can I marry such a pretty girl as you when I have no coat to put on? Off to the tailor she did go as fast as she could run. She bought him a coat, the best one there, and the soldier put it on. Soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your musket, fife, and drum? Oh, how can I marry such a pretty girl as you when I have no boots to put on? 
Off to the cobbler she did go as fast as she could run. She bought him a pair, the best ones there, and the soldier put them on. Soldier, soldier, will you marry me with your musket, fife, and drum? Oh, how can I marry such a pretty girl as you with a wife and a baby back home? Well, haberdashers, tailors, and cobblers still exist, but are much less common than they used to be. <clears throat> For women in Europe and America, the foundation was a shift or chemise, a nightgown type garment. Over that went a corset, or stays if you were working. Stays were shorter and less stiff. Long ago, a widow could have a shift wedding and be married at a crossroads, wearing only her shift, showing that her new husband was taking just her and none of her debts. <laughs> and working women needed loose clothes to scrub pots and knead bread. And if you had toddlers, you might tie them to your apron strings to keep them from tumbling into the fire. Cutting the apron strings became a metaphor for leaving mother behind. And we have many examples in museums of clothing from the past, but almost no aprons. There are a few fancy ones worn for special occasions, but the others people wore and they got through their day and they gradually became rags and disappeared. A mistress had clothes made just for her. In the 1700s, that was the open front gown, which could expand or contract to handle pregnancy and was easy to share. In the early 1800s, high-waisted gowns showed off the body without so many petticoats. But soon, wide skirts were back, and in each ensuing decade, shoulder seams moved down the arm until by mid-century they were halfway between shoulder and elbow. In the 1850s came the hoop a frame that held out many yards of skirt. Cool breezes beneath dismayed churchmen who saw it as an invitation to sin. I can testify how much more comfortable it is to wear a hoop than lots of petticoats. And black and white photos make it seem that people wore dull colors, but they loved eye-popping plaids and swirling patterns. A shade called poison green was a favorite. <laughs> The hoop craze was over in about 15 years. Skirts drew in at the front and sides, leaving a bustle in the back, but soon that went away as well. But corsets remained, and skirts reached the ground. In 1851, Elizabeth Smith Miller wore Turkish dress to the Seneca Falls home of Amelia Bloomer, who published a temperance magazine called The Lily. In the next issue, Bloomer announced that she had adopted this dress, trousers under a short skirt, and gave instructions on how to make them. They became popular, and the press dubbed them Bloomers after Amelia. In the summer of 1851, Bloomers were everywhere. Managers of a textile mill in Lowell gave a banquet for workers who adopted the safer dress. They were Bloomer balls and Bloomer picnics and dress reform societies. But the new costume was denounced as immoral, and public opinion slowly eliminated bloomers from public society. So here's a song from 1851 called The Bloomer's Complaint. <laughs> a woman is resisting criticism of her choice of clothing. She laments, laments that Dame Rumor is gossiping about her short skirts. And she says, well, men's fashions change all the time. Why can't women? So here is the bloomer's complaint. And we're getting toward the end here. So this is my next to last song. <clears throat> Dear me, what a terrible clatter they raise because that old gossip dame rumor declares with her hands lifted up in amaze that I'm coming out as a bloomer. Bloomer. I wonder how often these men must be told when a woman a notion one seizes. How often they ridicule, lecture, or scold. She'll do after all as she pleases. 
They know very well that their own fashions change with each little change of the season. But oh, it is monstrous and dreadful and strange and out of all manner of reason. If we take a fancy to alter our dress and come out in style a la bloomer, to hear what an outcry they make, I confess, is putting me quite out of humor. With my pants a la Turk and my skirts two feet long, all fitting, of course, most completely, these grumblers shall own after all they are wrong. And I in a bloomer look sweetly, yes, I in a bloomer look sweetly. Well, for a time, Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony and other suffragettes wore what they called freedom dress, but they were dismayed when crowds came to make fun of their scandalous outfits rather than listen to what they had to say, and they went back to long skirts to avoid controversy. In Western states, the practicality of bloomers kept them popular. Some 30 years later came the modern bicycle and women needed clothes suitable for riding and bloomers were perfect. Soon they were standard bicycle dress for women who took to the freedom of pedaling in droves. And the corset finally released its grip in the 1920s. Young women cut their hair and indulged in smoking and drinking and jazz dancing. The party was over with the Great Depression and clothing became more sedate. In the 40s, the military look took over, and in the 50s, there were poodle skirts and rock and roll and the rise of a rebellious youth culture. In the 60s came the miniskirt. <laughs> and in ensuing decades, fashion became less uniform. Today, you can wear a skirt of any length that you like, and women and when men actually wear quite similar clothing. Like many women, I seldom wear a skirt or a dress unless I'm getting dressed up. But when I put on my antique clothing, I sit up straight and move more deliberately. My comportment improves, something people used to learn as part of their education, how to move gracefully and maintain their dignity at all times. So thank you so much for coming on this journey with me, and I will leave you with a song that I wrote uh, inspired by the old ratio that it takes 12 times as long to spin thread as it does to weave cloth. This is called 12 to 1, and I thank you. Thank you so much to the museum and to my technical people. Uh, the room is full <laughs> of, of fellows who uh, have been rapt listeners. Oh, there's someone over there too, yes. Um, and I just adore performing in this room. It's, it's quite amazing. We have, you may have noticed we have not provided me the, with a mic close to my mouth and a mic for my, we just got one here, which is capturing this glorious room. So here is the last song of this uh, program, 12 to 1. <clears throat> In a day no more existing, spinning wheels went round and round. Fingers drew the fibers twisting into thread. Ida May and Henrietta, Hepzibah and Charity, early learned to work the treadle. idle hands from dawn till the evening chime in a time hard to conceive a women spun and mended we then the thread goes to the weaver shuttle flying to and fro on his loom roll by roll the Heavy wool to make a great coat. Come
Cotton for a summer frock Linen for my lady's chamber Soon to sew And to keep one weaver working Took twelve spinners all their time No such thing as idle hands From dawn until the evening chime In a time hard to conceive count the generations spinning every stitch they wore bound up in the old equation till the mill made it no more oh but that's another story save it for another song Lydia and Emmeline went to the mill thread spun by machine or woven by machine into our clothes frees us up for other pleasures other toil and to keep one weaver working took twelve spinners all their time no such thing as idle hands from dawn till evening chime in a time hard to conceive Thank you.